Hi, my name's Paul Grogan and welcome to the Gaming Rules How to Play video for Sanctum, designed by Philip Neduck and published by Czech Games Edition. In Sanctum, you and up to three other players take on the roles of heroes and must fight your way through hordes of demons to arrive at the walls of Sanctum. After breaching the walls, you must confront the demon lord itself. Although the heroes strive towards the same goal, the player who survives the final confrontation with the most health will be victorious. The game comes with three double-sided boards for the six acts of the game. For a two-player game, place the boards for acts one and three on the table. For a three and four-player game, use acts one and two instead. Place the horde board to the side of act one, and sort the demon cards out demon side up in three decks according to the icon in the upper right corner. Red, green and blue cards will be mixed together. Shuffle each deck and place them on the hordes board. Place the achievement board at the side of your second act board, and shuffle the achievement tiles face down. Distribute 11 of them randomly on the spaces of the achievement board, and return the 12th to the box without looking at it. In a two-player game, things are slightly different. Three achievement spaces will not be used. So for each level, choose a random space by rolling a die, and place the die in the corresponding space. Then deal eight achievement tiles to the remaining spaces, and return the four unused tiles to the box. And then remove the dice. There are three divine intervention tiles in the game. You'll use only two of them depending on the number of players. The Act 5 tile is always used. Place it on the achievement board and put dice on it, one per player. In a two player game you start with boards 1 and 3, and you put the Act 3 divine intervention tile on board 3, placing two dice on it. In a three player game you start with boards 1 and 2, so you put the Act 2 divine intervention tile on board 2, and three dice on it. In a four player game you will use the Act 3 tile once the Act 3 board comes into play, so for now just set it aside with four dice on it. Each player takes a character board and matching figure. You can assign these randomly or allow players to choose. Place your rage tile on your board as shown with the active side up. Your stamina pool starts with the number of stamina tokens printed here, and your focus pool starts with the number of blue focus tokens printed here. Take your health counter and place it on the top space of your health track. You start the game with two dice. Take a third die and place it on the angel icon in your gem pool. This isn't yours yet, but you will receive it during the game. Place a white gem on top of the die. The skill table is what makes your character unique. Take the nine skills belonging to your character, some are cards and some are tiles. Each of your skills has the icon according to your character. Lay them out according to their Roman numerals. Red numerals go in the column on the left, green in the middle and blue on the right in order of 1, 2, 3 from top to bottom. Place the appropriate number and type of gems depicted on each skill. Some skills will have stamina and or focus tokens. If they do, place the appropriate tokens on the flame symbols. These nine skills are what your character can acquire during the game. You don't have them yet, but the text on them shows what skill you will get once you have removed all of the gems from it. Each player gets one silver pipped die. Put yours on the skill with the die icon. You will gain this dice once you acquire that skill. Each player takes the quick reference sheet according to the character they're playing, with a summary of the game on the front, and a list of all of their skills on the back. Choose the starting player at random, maybe the last player to play a computer game where you fight demons. According to the table in the rulebook, each player gets starting bonuses depending on their position in turn order. If you get a potion, flip it as if it were a coin, and then place it on one of your potion slots. If you get a card, locate the skills shown on the card and move the depicted gem one space up. Place both types of Demon Lord card to the side, you will need them in the final battle. And form a general supply consisting of the stamina and focus markers, the potions and the hit markers. You're now ready to start the game. Beginning with the first player and going clockwise around the table, players take turns, taking one of three possible actions, move, fight or rest. The game plays out over several acts as the characters travel along the act boards, fight demons, gain experience and new items, becoming more powerful. Once one character reaches the walls of Sanctum, Act 5 begins. Following this is Act 6, where the confrontation with the Demon Lord takes place and introduces a new set of rules. Whoever survives the final battle in the best health wins the game. Your first action in the game will be to move, so I'll explain that first. When you move, you advance the game forward and acquire more demons to fight. 
perform these four steps in order as can be seen on the player aid. On the first player's turn, they advance by placing their figure on the first space of the Act 1 board. Then, check the banner under that space. This tells you what demons to reveal. The first space says to deal out five sets of level 1 demons, two demons per set. Step 3 is to take demons, and the first player must now take one set of demons and place it on their battle board. And step 4 only happens once a player reaches the last space of an act board, so I'll cover this later on. And that is the end of the first player's turn. The second player now goes, and again, must choose the move action first. They place their figure on the next space, reveal one new set of demons, take a set of demons, and then it's the next player's turn. Once all players have had a turn, play returns back to the first player, who now has a choice of whether to move or fight. There is no point in resting at this stage of the game. For this video, let's assume that the dancer chooses to move again. When you move, if you are not at the front, you move to the front. However, if you are already at the front, like the Huntress is here, you move ahead one space. And again, you reveal new demons. Here, you just place one level 2 demon. And then you take a set of demons. Sometimes a set is just one card, so you can take just that. But if a set contains more than one card, you must take the whole set. You can continue moving and taking more demons, but be careful about taking too many, as eventually you'll need to fight them. If you move on to the last space of an act board, as the last step of your move action, you open the treasure chest. First, flip all remaining demon cards over to the item side. And then beginning with you and continuing in the current marching order of the figures on the boards, each player chooses one of these items and puts it in their sack. Note that each player takes only one item, even if it was in a set of two. And then clear all remaining cards off the board. Your second action in the game could be to fight. This is where you try to defeat the demons that you're currently facing to gain experience and loot. However, you may get wounded in the process. When you fight, perform the following six steps as can be seen on your reference sheet. The first step is using potions. You won't do this before your first fight, so I'll skip this for now and come back to it later. Step two is where you roll your dice. You start the game with two of these, but you will gain more dice as the game goes on. Step three is where you attack, using your dice to hit the demons. To hit a demon, you must match one of the dice shown at the bottom of the card. Level 1 demons have only one dice, level 2 require two dice, and level 3 have three dice. For example, you can hit this demon with a 1 or a 6. You don't need to roll a 1 and a 6 at the same time, although you will need to hit both locations to kill it. If you're lucky, you might roll exactly what you need, but usually this won't be the case, and this is where your abilities come in. Some of the abilities on your character allow you to modify your dice. This one, for example, allows you to modify a dice by plus or minus 1. The ability costs one focus to use, so you must move one focus from your pool onto the ability to use it. And you cannot use the ability again until the token has been removed. Some abilities are purple, meaning that you can use either stamina or focus to activate them. At the start of the game, you also have a rage token. If active, you can flip the token face down to allow you to change any one of your dice to any result. Be careful though when you use this, as it only refreshes under certain circumstances. So for example here, you are fighting against two level 1 demons. Pretty easy. They need a 1 and a 3 to hit them, but you roll a 2 and a 6. You can use one focus to activate this ability, turning the 2 into a 3 and hit the skeleton demon, but you don't have any abilities to turn the 6 into a 1, but you could flip your rage token over instead. This kills both demons, easy peasy. After your attack, if there are still demons left to kill, and you have dice left that you did not assign, you become enraged, and you can flip your rage tile back to its active side. Step 4 is blocking. If you have hit all the locations of a demon, you have killed it. Any demons that you did not manage to kill hit you back and deal the full amount of damage shown on the bottom of the card. You may now try to block that damage by using your abilities with one or more shield icons. Each shield icon blocks one point of damage. Many block abilities have two spaces. To use this ability, you must place two tokens on it. Each token must match its space, but remember, purple can be red or blue. For each point of damage that you cannot block, you take one wound and move your health counter one space down on your track. Remember that at the end of the game, it's the player with the most health left that is the winner, so try to avoid taking wounds if you can. Step 5 is the good bit. You get to loot the bodies of the demons that you killed. Look at the gems depicted in the top right corner of each demon that you killed, 
and for each gem on the card, you move one matching gem in your skill table up to the next space. White gems match any colour. For example, if you defeated this demon, you could move one green gem or one white gem. When you defeat this demon, you move two gems, blue or white, and you could move the same gem twice. When you move the last gem off a skill, you acquire that skill. I'll explain skills in a later chapter. After gaining levels from a demon, flip it over to reveal the loot gained. You may have noticed that there's an icon on the front of the demon. This indicates what type of loot the demon has, and it will help you in deciding which ones to fight. Keep any items that you looted in your item sack, which can hold any number of items. You can equip them only during a rest action. Demons that were not killed remain on your board. If you have assigned any dice to them, replace those dice with hit markers. Those hits carry over to the next fight, so you'll never need to hit that same location twice. The final step of the fight is to check for any achievements, but I'll explain this in a later chapter too. For now, I'm going to return you back to step 1, which, if you remember, I skipped explaining at the start of this chapter, since it doesn't apply to your first fight. But normally, before you roll the dice, you may discard as many of your potions as you want, and for each red potion discarded, you regenerate 1 stamina. For each blue potion discarded, you regenerate 1 focus. And you regenerate by moving a token from an ability space back to your appropriate pool, which is then available to be spent in that combat. Some of the ability spaces are two space abilities. You are allowed to regenerate from both of these spaces with two potions, making the ability available again. But also, you could just regenerate from one of the spaces. In this case, the regenerated token is available again, but you cannot use the ability until both spaces are empty. In this example, you have taken the move action on the first two turns of the game, and you are now being pursued by three demons. On your third turn of the game, you choose to fight. You roll your dice and get two sixes. One of the sixes can be used to hit the level two demon, which damages it, but doesn't kill it. The other six doesn't match any of the remaining hit locations. However, you have abilities that modify your dice. You spend one focus on this ability to turn the six into a four, and then another focus on this ability to turn the four into a three, which kills the green demon. The demons now attack you back, dealing a total of three damage. Remember, a wounded demon still fights back at full strength. If you don't prevent this damage, that's three wounds, which is really bad. So you decide to spend two stamina on this ability, which blocks two of the damage, and you can then take one wound for the remaining damage. You then gain one level for killing the green demon, and can move one green or white gem up one space. You then flip the card over to reveal the item which you place in your sack. You then remove your dice, placing a hit marker on the location that you hit with the six. On your next turn, you could fight again, using a potion to restore some of your focus, and using your rage token. Or you could rest to get all of your stamina and focus back, and equip the emerald wristband. You could also move, but that's probably not a good idea. And note, this was just one example, with one option of what you could do. You could have used your rage to set one of the sixes to a five, and killed the level two demon without using any focus. You would have then taken only two damage, which you could have prevented, and you would have gained two levels and a more powerful item. The decisions you make in the game are yours. When you move the last gem off a skill, you acquire that skill, and you remove it from your skill tree. Skills do not have to be gained in order. You can have a level 2 or level 3 skill without ever earning any skill of level 1. Note, however, that when you move a gem off a level 3 skill, you move it onto a level 2 skill, which makes that skill harder to get, so it can be an interesting choice on how your character progresses. The space that held the skill still counts as a space in your skill table. For example, if you have removed your level 2 skill, then a gem moving from your level 3 skill will move onto the level 2 space. Some skills simply give you more stamina and or focus. During setup, you should have put tokens onto these tiles, and when you gain the skill, you move their tokens to the respective pools. Flip the tile over and keep it nearby, in case you need to check how much stamina and focus your board should have. Some skills give you an effect that can be used at certain times during the game. When you gain the skill, perform any immediate effect printed on the card. Then, flip the card over and place it in the corresponding skill space on the left side of your player board. The card will tell you what it does and when you can use it. And all skill cards are explained in more detail on the back of your reference sheet. 
The final option to explain is the rest action, something every hero needs to do once in a while. You can even rest when you have demons on your board. You just run away for a bit and hide somewhere while they look for you. When you rest, perform these four steps as shown on your reference sheet. First, restore all your used stamina and focus, moving the tokens from your abilities back into their pools. Resting does not allow you to reflip your rage tile, and I'm saying this here because intuitively some people think that it does, but your rage tile is about you being angry, not about you being rested, and only flips back in combat as explained earlier. Step 2 is where you get to equip your new items. To equip an item, you need gems that match what is depicted on the item. A white gem can be used as a gem of any colour. Place the item in the slot with the matching item icon. If it's a weapon, you have two slots to choose from. Then, put the gems on the matching spaces on the card. If you don't have all of the gems required, you cannot equip the item. For example, you have collected these three items and have a blue and a white gem. You can equip the feathered cap with the white gem and the seer's cowl with the blue gem. However, both of these items are headgear, and you only have one head, so you can't equip them both. You decide to equip the acrobat's shoes, putting the item in your boot slot and placing the blue gem and the white gem on it. Your two headgear items stay in your sack. Remember back to the setup rules, you started the game with a white gem in your pool on top of a die. Well, when you equip your first item, even if you don't use the white gem, you gain that die. Any items you already have equipped may be reorganised freely during your rest action, and items can be moved to your sack, freeing up their gems for different items. Some items give you stamina or focus. For each red flame icon, add one extra stamina to your stamina pool, and for each blue flame icon, add one extra focus to your focus pool. You keep these tokens as long as you have the item equipped, and lose them if you remove the item. Whenever you reorganise your items, double check your stamina and focus totals to make sure that you have the right amount. Step 3 is buying potions. You will eventually get into a situation where you have excess items in your sack that you no longer want. In this case, you can discard them to gain potions, one potion for each item that you discard. You can freely choose which potion you take, regardless of the item's colour. You can carry one potion in each of your potion slots. Usually you have four potion slots, but some characters have skills that might change this number. If you don't have an empty potion slot, you can discard a potion of one colour to make room for a potion of another colour. Step 4 of resting is to check the achievements board, which I'll explain in the next chapter. An achievement is a reward for being the first player to accomplish a particular goal. You check to see if you qualify for an achievement at the end of a fight action or a rest action. Achievements come in three categories, plus a bonus category, as depicted on the achievement board. Skill mastery is the achievement for gaining skills. You gain an achievement if you are the first player to have three, five or seven skills. This achievement counts all skills you have gained, whether cards or tiles. Gem mastery is for gaining gems. In particular, you need gems of two different colours, and white gems do not count. If you are the first player to have gained at least two, three or four gems in each of two colours, you get the Gem Mastery achievement. Equip Mastery is for equipping items. Count the level of all items you have equipped. An item's level is the number of gem icons that it has. If you're the first player with 4, 7 or 10 levels equipped, you gain an Equip Mastery achievement. Higher level mastery is an achievement that you get if you are the first player to achieve a level 2 or level 3 mastery in skills, gems or equipping. It is possible to get multiple achievements at once. When you gain an achievement, take the tile from the achievement board. Each achievement offers a hidden blessing. You can look at your blessing now, but keep it hidden from the other players. Blessings will be used when you are in the final act of the game. When all characters have moved off the Act 1 board, remove it and slide the remaining board over. Then put a new board in place. You never need more than two boards at a time. In a four-player game, you will use all boards from Acts 1 to 6 in order. In a 3 player game, skip Act 3. And in a 2 player game, skip Acts 2 and 4. Twice during the game, the gods intervene in your journey, granting the heroes increased power. This is represented by the divine intervention tiles that I talked about in setup. In a 2 and 3 player game, the first divine intervention tile is placed on the second board in setup. In a 4 player game, you need to put the Act 3 divine intervention tile on the board when you add board 3 to the table. And when a character moves to the space marked by the Divine Intervention tile, 
all players gain an extra die and the tile is then discarded. The first player to move onto board 5 places their figure on the matching space. They then place 5 pairs of demons as indicated here and chooses one pair to add to their battle board as normal. Only the first player adds demons to the Act 5 board. Players who move onto the board later will have fewer pairs to choose from. The Act 5 Divine Intervention tile is removed from the board and each player receives one more die. Players at the Walls of Sanctum can't move anymore. On their turns they can only rest or fight, trying to defeat all the demons that they are currently facing. If you start your turn at the Walls of Sanctum with no demons, you may breach the walls. Your only other option is to rest, which you would only do if you wanted to get an Equip Mastery achievement. To breach the walls, advance your figure to the Cathedral space. You then remove the achievement board and replace it with board 6. It's now no longer possible to gain achievements. Shuffle the Demon Lord deck that you set aside during setup and place it on the matching illustration, drawing the top two cards of the deck and placing them here. On the other players' turns, they can choose to answer the call to arms by discarding all remaining demons on their battle board and entering the city. This can even be done by players who have not yet reached board 5. If you answer the call to arms immediately, that is, on your first turn after the walls were breached, place your figure with the player who breached the walls. Alternatively, you can fight or rest. Or, if you are not yet on board 5, you can choose to move to the walls of Sanctum. Each time the player who breached the walls gets a turn, they add a new Demon Lord card to the board, placing the third card here, and then the fourth card here. If you answer the call to arms after one of these cards has been placed, you move your figure to the most recent card. Once there are four cards in total that have been placed, all remaining players must answer the call on their next turn. For example, the Outlaw breaches the walls. He moves to the Cathedral and places two cards here. On her turn, the Huntress decides to join him, placing her figure next to his. The other two players could also join him, but they choose to fight instead. On the Outlaw's next turn, he places the third card here. The Dancer decides to join on her next turn, but the Slayer wants to fight once more. So on the Outlaw's next turn, he lays down the final card here, and then the Slayer must join immediately. After all characters have joined, there is a brief respite as all characters take their final rest action of the game. No more achievements can be gained at this point, so players can do this simultaneously. This is your last chance to equip anything, and you should check your stamina and focus totals to ensure that they are correct. Buy as many potions as you can, and then you discard any remaining unequipped items along with everything else on your skill table. You won't need it anymore. Move your achievement tiles to your newly emptied gem pool and turn them over to reveal your blessings. Just before Act 6 begins, the Demon Lord shakes the City of Sanctum with his mighty power. One at a time, turn over each of the Demon Lord cards and resolve its effect. Characters at the Cathedral are only affected by the first two cards. Players who answered the call later are affected by all cards that were already laid down when they answered the call. If you have any blessings, you can use them at this time to help prevent the effects of the Demon Lord cards. Shuffle the deck of Fury cards, then deal 5 Demon Lord cards and 4 Fury cards to each player, alternating like this. The cards should be dealt at random and in order from left to right. Be careful not to look at the other side of the cards at this time. Place your figure on the leftmost card of your battle board. The final battle is divided into rounds. In each round, all players take one fight action and can play simultaneously. There is no more resting. Between rounds, all players will suffer the Demon Lord's Wrath. Each round of the battle is like a normal fight action, but with a few changes. You can use your blessings by flipping them face down. Each one of them is one use only. You can assign hit only to the card that your figure is on. But once you have hit all of the locations on a card, you can then move your figure to the next card. There's no limit to how many cards you can hit and move onto each round as long as you have dice to do so. As you move onto a Fury card, flip it over and resolve the effect immediately, which applies only to you and only once. You must defeat this card as normal before moving on. When blocking damage, you face all of the damage on your current card and also all of the damage on all cards ahead of it. Note that Fury cards only deal damage if their hidden side has been revealed. Everything else follows the usual rules. Specifically, you can use potions at the start of any round, dice that could not be assigned as hits will activate your rage, and after you block, replace your dice with hit markers and take your dice back. 
Cards that you have already defeated won't affect you anymore, and hits on those that were not defeated will carry over to the next round, just like when fighting demons. Once everyone has performed one fight, the Demon Lord unleashes an earth-shaking attack. Deal two demon cards face down in a row. Then one by one, reveal each card and resolve it. After each round of fighting, the Demon Lord roars again. Each time you deal one fewer card than you dealt before. So in a normal game, you'll have a round of fighting, then a two card roar, another round of fighting, then a one card roar, and then more rounds of fighting until everyone is dead or victorious. However, you can customize the difficulty of the game, and you should choose this at the start of the game, but it only actually affects this point. The difficulty is essentially how many cards are in the initial roar. On the hardest mode, Inferno, the initial roar is five cards, meaning that it's four cards next round, then three, then two, then one. Good luck with that. So, for example, I'm about to start the final battle, and this is my battle board. I have seven stamina, five focus, three potions, two blessings, and two relevant skills. In round one, I roll the following dice. I assign the one and the three to the first card, allowing me to move on. I reveal Ignite, and must corrupt one ability space. So I choose the single ability space on my armor, which can now no longer be used. I place a three onto the Ignite card, but I don't have a six. So, I use a focus on the ability of my shoes, turning a 2 into a 6, placing it on the card, and then moving on. I then use my rage token to turn a 4 into a 6, placing it on the third card. After my attack, I suffer 8 damage from all of the visible cards that I haven't cleared. This includes the one that I'm on. I place 2 stamina on my hat ability to prevent 5 of the damage, 1 more stamina on the other hat ability to prevent another one, 1 stamina on my shoes, and then flip over my blessing to prevent the final damage. No wounds. I then clear the dice off the cards, marking the location that I've already hit on the card that I'm on with a hit marker. There's no need to mark the locations on cards that I've already passed. The demon then roars. The first card is Endless Thirst, causing me to drink a potion, but I lose whatever I regenerate. So I spend the potion and regenerate one of the tokens on the double space ability of my hat. The next roar effect is Rain of Fire, which makes me corrupt a red ability space. I don't really want to do that, so instead I choose to take a wound. In round 2, my outnumbered skill activates because there are 7 hit locations visible and I only have 5 dice, so my rage token flips back. I then use a stamina potion to regenerate the other token from my hat ability, allowing me to use it again. I then roll and get this. I place the 1 on the card that I'm on, and then move on, revealing Claw Strike, which has no special effect, but requires 3 dice to eliminate. I only have a 5 that matches, so I place that on the card. I then spend 1 focus to use this ability of my crossbow, turning a 2 into a 6, placing that on the card, and then use my Rage to turn a 3 into a 1, allowing me to move on to the next card. I then use this ability here to change the 2 into a 1, and that's all of my dice placed. This time I suffer 6 damage, but manage to prevent 5 of it with my hat ability, taking only 1 wound. I retrieve my dice, and mark the hit location of the card I'm on. The Demon Lord roars once again, this time just one card, and it's Hellscream. Looking at the situation, I've got 4 points of damage prevention available to me, and that blessing could be really useful, so I choose to take the wound instead. At the start of round 3, my outnumbered skill doesn't trigger, since I have 5 dice and there are 5 hit locations. And I choose not to use my remaining potion at this stage. I roll and get this. I place the 4, and move on, revealing Growl. I re-roll my 2, and get another 4. I then use the ability of my crossbow to reduce the 5 to a 2, and the ability of my shoes to turn another 4 into a 2, placing both 2s on this card and moving on. I then use my Blessing to turn my 4 into a 6, and along with my remaining 1, place them on this card, allowing me to move on. It's another Ignite card, and I must now choose another space to corrupt. I choose this one. And I now take 3 damage from the Demon, but prevent it with the ability of my armor. Round 4 now begins, and I use my Blue Potion to regenerate 1 focus from my crossbow. And I then roll. I assign the 1 and the 5 to this card, but I don't have a 4, and I've no way of getting 1. I suffer 3 damage, and with no way to prevent it, that's 3 wounds. Ouch. However, since I have unused dice, and hit locations remaining, my rage refreshes. In round 5, I roll this. I place the 4 on the current card, and move on. I then place the 2 on the last card, 
and use the ability of my crossbow to turn a 5 into a 6, and my poison blade skill to turn that 6 into a 1. Huzzah! I survived the fight with 4 health remaining. If you defeat all the cards on your battle board, you are victorious. Other players continue to play until they are victorious or they are killed, which happens if you lose all of your health. If only one player survived the final battle, they win the game. If more than one player was victorious, the winner is the one with the highest health remaining, with ties broken in favour of the player who earned more achievements during the game. If all players were eliminated, the winner is the one who defeated the most cards in the final battle, with ties broken in favour of the player who got the most hit on their current card. I hope you found this video useful in learning how to play the game Sanctum. Please remember to like, subscribe and share the video with your gaming group in advance of your next game session. Thank you very much to Czech Games Edition for asking me to create this video and for sponsoring it, and if you want to support the channel, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Until next time, take care and thanks for watching. Gaming Rules is proudly sponsored by Game Toppers, upgrading your gaming experience. Visit GameToppersLLC.com.